Good morning, you brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ is risen. Christos was Christ. Christos Aneste. Amas Hekam. Christos Amviat. It's great to be with you again for our weekly chat. Hoping that this past week has been a blessed one for you and your loved ones, that you're doing well, that you're rejoicing in the re resurrection of our risen Lord, that you're taking the time to be family. That's really important. So this morning, as we all continue to bask in the days following our Lord's resurrection, I wanted to take the time to take a look at this upcoming Sunday's Paschal theme, which is the Sunday of the Myrrh-Bearing Women. It's meaning for us, what we can learn from it. So stay tuned. As always in our podcast, if you have any questions or any comments, please enter them in the section below, and I'll try to get to them as soon as I can. Let's begin with our troparian for our Lord's Resurrection, Pascha. Christos was Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. So, the Mermaid Women's Sunday, which is this, this coming Sunday. I'm going to do a, a real brief reflection from Father Schmemann's wonderful book, The Church Year. This is what he talks about. When you listen to the account of our Lord's crucifixion and his death during Holy Week, one is invariably struck by one detail in the story, the loyalty to the very end of only a handful of people, mostly women, about whom the Gospels tell us almost nothing. What we do know is that Christ's disciples, all of them, ran away and left him behind. The chief of the disciples, Peter, denied him three times. Judas betrayed him. The crowds that followed Christ while he was preaching and each person expecting to get something from him. They saw his miracles. They saw his healings. They expected freedom from the hated Roman occupation. They expected him to, to, to take care of their earthly cares and put themselves as heads. These countless people poorly understood the meaning of our Lord's teaching, if they even really heard it at all. That teaching of self-renunciation, that teaching of love, of sacrifice, of wholehearted self-giving. For many people in the time of Christ, they saw him as a handout, an offer to help, an offer of help. And so they came and they followed him. But then, when they realized they were mistaken, growing hatred toward him took, took place not only on the part of the national leaders and those in authority, but also on the part of the general people. In Christ's preaching of love, the crowds now began to hear him foretelling that through this love, he would offer himself as a sacrifice. And the crowds, naturally, began to thin, began to melt, melt away. This was not what they wanted to hear. Who wanted to follow a guy who was going to sacrifice himself, Right? Christ's earthly glory and human success burst into bright flame for the last time on Palm Sunday, his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. When in the words of the Gospel of Matthew, all the city was stirred. But that was only for a moment. And even then, didn't the crowds greet him with such joy and enthusiasm only because once again they expected him to become the king, to become the one that would take over and defeat the Romans, to give them victory, power, and glory. But as we know, all of this suddenly ended. After Palm Sunday came the darkness of Holy Week, the loneliness and inconceivable grief that everyone felt. And was not the most painful part of these final days a betrayal by close friends and disciples to whom Christ had truly given himself totally. In the Garden of Gethsemane, even the three disciples closest to him did not stand firm, but fell asleep 
while Christ was in his final prayerful agony, sweating blood and preparing for his horrible death. We know that even Peter, who so loudly promised to die with Christ, wavered at the last moment and renounced, rejected, and betrayed him, not just once, but three times. But not everyone did, as it turned out. The cross of our Lord brings on the hour of simple human faithfulness and love. Those who in time of success seem so removed, whom we almost never meet in the pages of the Gospels, to whom Christ had given no advance word of his resurrection, and for whom, therefore, everything ended and was lost on the night of the cross. Those were the people who proved faithful, who remained at the cross in steadfast human love. The evangelist John writes, standing by the cross, were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Later, after the death of Jesus, as we find in the Gospel of St. Matthew, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus, but in secret. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen shroud, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. And he rolled a great stone in the door of the tomb and departed. One day later, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the third day, those same women came to the grave, in keeping with the custom of that time, to anoint the dead body with aromatic, aromatic spices. It was precisely to them that the risen Christ first appeared. They were the first to hear from him rejoice, which forever afterwards became the essence of Christian strength. Christ had not revealed the mystery of the future to these women, as he did to the twelve chosen apostles. They knew neither the meaning of his death, nor the mystery of his approaching victory in the resurrection. For them, the death of their teacher and friend was simply death, the end. Even worse, it was a terrible and shameful death, a terrible and abrupt end to their friend. They stood at the cross only because they loved Jesus, and in loving him, they suffered with him. They did not leave his poor, tortured body, but did all that love has always done at the final separation. They tried to take care of it. Those whom Christ had asked to stay with him at the hour of his agonizing struggle, when he began to be greatly distressed and troubled, dropped him like a hot potato. They ran away. They renounced him. But those from whom he asked nothing remained faithful in their simple human love. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Down through the centuries, love has always wept in this way. Just as Christ wept at the grave of his friend Lazarus. So here then, it is in this love that we see on the Sunday of the Mirabean Women, which first learns of the victory. This love, this faithfulness, is the first to know that there is no longer any need for crying. For death is swallowed up in victory, and hopeless separation is no more. For us, this is what we have to take out of the Sunday of the Myrrh-bearing Women. It reminds us, or it should remind us, that the love and faithfulness of a few individuals shone brightly in the midst of hopeless darkness. This Sunday calls us to ensure that in this world, love and faithfulness do not disappear or die out. It judges our lack of courage. It judges our lack of fear. It judges our fear, our, un our endless and our servile rationalizations. What does that mean? It means we can try to justify ourselves in not doing loving acts, in not doing kindful acts. We can't do that. In the end, only love and faithfulness are what matters. The mysterious Joseph and Nicodemus and those women who go to the grave at that dawn, the first dawn of Easter, occupies little space in the Gospels. But pre precisely here, however, is where the eternal fate of each of us will be decided. It's important that we need to recover this love and basic human loyalty. As you all well know, we've entered a time when even these are being discredited by harmful concepts of the person in human life, which now prevails in our society. 
for centuries. The world still had that weak but still flickering and shining glow from the faithfulness, love, and co-suffering, which was silently present at the sufferings of Jesus. And we need to cling as if to a last thread to everything in our world that still thrives on the warm light of the simple earthly human love. Love does not ask about theories and ideologies, but speaks to the heart and soul. And isn't it amazing that if we, if we try to look at what we've accomplished in, in, in our human world, what we have done, in one sense, we've made tremendous advances, right? Tremendous technological advances. But then one wonders to what extent are these advances important? To what extent do they guarantee our souls that safe haven? And the answer is, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. You know, there's one aspect of the, the nightly news that, that always perks my attention, besides all the mundane stuff that goes on. Um, one network calls it, you know, glimmer of hope. One network calls it um, one, re one uh, free, I forget what the word is. But anyway, it's a little, little snippet or section about something that someone does good for somebody else or some good experience that happens to um, a, a person in, in terms of, of being loving and kind to someone else. I always think to myself, man, if they could only do that more, they could only show more of that instead of all the, the other garbage they show on the news, what a great message that would be, right? We'll come back to that. Let's take our first break. And of course, my computer's acting up again. But we're going to take our first break and listen to the beautiful The Angel Cried, the hymn of Easter to the Theotokos. <laughs> There's a couple comments from my dear daughter, who I love dearly. Buy a new computer? I don't think so. Computer's fine. It was the Wi-Fi that was acting up. Uh, and yes, this also is one of my favorite songs. But back to, back to the sense of, of this theme of, of Sunday of the Murbury and Women. I think too often we, we kind of take for granted that something as simple as, as love and faithfulness is, is truly the one thing needful in, in our lives, not only to make our own lives better, because it certainly does, but to make society better, to make our neighborhoods better, to make our cities better. Um, and that, that simple love and faithfulness, like we saw with, with the example of the Murbang women, 
is such that we need to be motivated to look beyond ourselves, you know. As Father Schmidt wrote, wrote in my, my previous little meditation several minutes ago, you know, the women, women weren't given the, the, the insights to what Christ's ministry was, was about and, and why, what the miracles foretold or whatever. They weren't a part of that. The only reason the church remembers these myrrh-bearing women was because of their love and their faithfulness. All they knew was it was the custom of their faith to go and anoint the body of the deceased and to very carefully and lovingly be prepared for you know its burial. But it's it's the it's the love and the faithfulness that we need to capture, you know. Um, and consider this for a second. Being a loyal follower, showing love and faithfulness, sometimes, you know, is not the easy thing to do. Sometimes being loving and faithful, but it can certainly transform us. Um, for the women, the hard part was, as they were walking, remember, they said, who's going to roll away the stone for us? That stone is huge. Or we might get into trouble. The authorities might imprison us. They might arrest us for trespassing. But they still went. They wanted to finish the job of anointing the body of Christ. They weren't expecting to find angels or a miracle. They were simply faithful to God. So that should be a reminder to us that doing what is right can lead to amazing experiences in our lives. When we lay aside earthly cares to be active members of our Orthodox faith, we experience the love of God. We become his vessels, if you were, bringing that love and that saving message of Christ to others by our actions, not by our words, by our actions. We can be inspired by these Mirbaran women because their love and dedication to Christ led them to the tomb. Putting our faith in Christ in action must be part of who we are if we want to live a fulfilling life. And a fulfilling life obviously should be our goal, nothing else. Our service to God can be in a multitude of ways, right? We can help with service projects in the church. We can offer prayers for others. We can become choir members. We can become chanters. We can become members of our, of our you know, men's groups, our women's groups, whatever. Just to see that the ministry of Christ on earth continues. So, our Orthodox Church celebrates the faith of the Mirbang women this coming Sunday because in seeing a need and rising to the occasion, they became apostles to the apostles, bringing the message of the resurrection to the disciples. And if you recall, when they did go to the disciples and tell them the good news, they were not believed. Matter of fact, they were made fun of. They were ridiculed. They still performed their duty. They still, out of love and faithfulness to Christ, did what he told them to do, go and tell my brethren. And even though they, they were received with sarcastic remarks and whatever, in their hearts they knew they had done what was right. And that's the message to us. With, with love and faithfulness, we're empowered to do what is right by God. Not by our standards, by His. So, that's all I have for today. I hope this motivates us to take a look at how we live in the Paschal aftermath, the 40 days of Pascha. But more importantly, what we can take from the, the theme of the Sunday of the Mirror Bearing Women, that, that simple love and, and devotion and faithfulness to Christ, and how we can use that to expand our own ministries 
to the people in our lives. So, let me close with our prayer to the Most Holy Mother of God. Steadfast protectress of Christians, constant advocate before the Creator, do not despise the cry of us sinners, but in your goodness come speedily to help all who call upon you in faith. Hasten to our petition to intercede for us, O Theotokos, for you always protect those who honor you. Our prayers, dear viewers, are for, for, for all of you. We love you. We thank you for taking the time with us this, this day. Know that we lift you all up in prayer. We ask that you pray for us as well. And lifting each other up in prayer, we're truly united in Christ. But most importantly, with that love and faithfulness, we joyfully remind you, Christ is risen. Christos vos crece.